12,000 years ago, our ancestors realized, thinking ahead, that it wasn't necessary to carry on hunting animals and foraging for edible plants. They had the idea of planting the plants, of agriculture, and of breeding animals, of animal husbandry. With the keeping of animals and the planting of, uh, the, and, and, of, uh, and the development of agriculture came the development of permanent human settlements. It wasn't necessary to forage and hunt and gather all over the valley. So people stayed in the same place for long periods of time. And large groups of people accumulated in those places, much larger than the small hunter-gatherer groups that our instinctual emotional mechanisms prepared us for. So in towns, we had to develop new regulatory systems. We had to think them up, and our prefrontal lobes enabled us to do that. So thank heavens for prefrontal lobes. The abstract systems of language enabled us to write systems of laws and rules that govern civilized human behavior. This culminates in things like the Bill of Rights in the United Nations. But do we really live like that? Do we really obey those laws? Actually, there's a uniquely human tendency to hypocrisy. We say how we want to live, uh, we, 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 we sketch these ideals for ourselves, but we don't really live that way. You know, for example, the preamble to the United Nations Bill of Rights was written by a countryman of mine, Jan Christian Smuts, who was a white supremacist. Think of it. Why is this human tendency there? That's why I've mentioned all of these spans of evolutionary time. It's because prefrontal lobe development merely 200,000 years ago became uniquely human. And only 12,000 years ago we began to live in permanent settlements. All of this is a little cork bobbing on the ocean of the 525 million or 200 million years of evolutionary time that designed these deeper systems which have so much more power to govern the way that the mind works. We do have free will, but not as much as we like to believe we do. That free will rests, as I've explained, upon our capacity to think, which rests upon our capacity to inhibit instinctual emotional tendencies. This gives us great flexibility and it's an enormous adaptive advance, but it comes at a price. By inhibiting those instinctual emotional systems, we don't know why we do what we do. This opacity, this lack of awareness of our own motivational impetus is another uniquely human property. This is why we ask, what's it all for? What, you know, what, what does this all mean? Other animals know perfectly well what it's all for and what it all means. Think about it. In Blombos Cave, here in South Africa, 70,000 years ago, the first known cultural artifact was produced, a piece of ochre that somebody had cross-hatched in some sort of symbolic fashion. It didn't serve any useful purpose. It seemed to mean something, these lines that I was going to say she etched on the stone. I always imagine for some reason it's a woman who made it. I suspect that if I was to able, be able to speak to that woman and ask her, why did you do that? What motivated you to make these uniquely human symbolic markings on that piece of ochre? She'd say, I don't know. That's a uniquely human thing to do. In fact, there's another uniquely human thing that she might do. She might make up a story about it, confabulate, and say, well, those lines will make it rain or Know, somehow control the gods or some nonsense like that. That's another uniquely human attribute, born of language, our tendency to confabulate, make up stories. <laughs>